In this video, I'd like to talk about troubleshooting using a time domain reflectometer. Whether you're troubleshooting an aircraft, or a cable system someone's previously cut the cord on, or a computer network that can have hundreds of miles of wire in them, the TDR can save you hours or even days of troubleshooting time. Now the most common method of troubleshooting is to use a multimeter. It's a simple device that easily tells you if you have an open or a short in a wire, but it will not tell you where that open or short is. If you'd like to learn how to use a multimeter, please see my video on how to troubleshoot a two-wire system. Anyway, now that you've found the problem wire, remove the multimeter and hook up your TDR. The screen on the TDR will give you a graphical trace. It'll look something like this if you have an open, or something like this if you have a short. The actual problem is shown right here. Reading the scale on the bottom, you'll see that it's approximately 56 feet out from the end of the wire you're measuring. Later in this video, I'll go into greater detail on how to read this screen. So, exactly how does a TDR work? Well, pretty much the same way as a radar system. The radar sends out a radio wave pulse, and at the same time it starts a timer. The pulse travels through the air, strikes the object, then is reflected back. When the pulse returns to the radar unit, the timer is stopped. The following formula is then used to calculate the distance. First, you cut the time in half. This is because that time represented traveling both directions. We only want one direction. Then you multiply that time by the velocity, or how fast that radio wave was moving. In this case, it's moving at the speed of light. You now know how far away that object is. A TDR does the same thing, but instead of using a radio wave, it sends an electrical impulse. The pulse travels down the wire, strikes the fault, then returns. Since you're dealing with wire instead of open air, an accurate measurement requires you to consider a few other factors. The first is, the test set is hooked up using test leads. Since your electrical pulse travels down the test leads before getting to your cable, the length of the leads will be included in your distance. All TDRs that I've ever used give me a software option to eliminate the test lead error. The other problem is the actual pulse itself. The test set receiver is turned off during the width of the pulse. So on a standard TDR, this effectively gives you a dead zone where you can't see faults within the first two feet of the wire. More advanced TDRs let you change the width of this pulse. You can shorten it, giving yourself a smaller dead zone, but this also reduces the length of cable you can check. You want to measure a longer cable? make the pulse wider, but this will also increase your dead zone length. If you decide you just don't want to deal with this pulse width problem, spend a little bit more money, or maybe a lot bit more money, and buy a special TDR called a STEP TDR. It has technology in it that avoids this problem. So when looking at the TDR screen, the calculated distance of your fault will be displayed at the bottom of the screen. Speaking of distance, let's go back and take another look at how we calculated it. We timed how long it would take a radio wave traveling at the speed of light to make it from our target back to our receiver. Our velocity was the speed of light. Now here's the catch. We've got a little problem. When your electrical impulse is traveling down a wire, it does not travel at the speed of light. The speed of your test signal actually depends on the material that it's traveling through. If it's vacuum, it's 100% of the speed of light. However, send it through a twisted wire pair, it'll slow down to approximately 50 to 75% of the speed of light. This speed is called the velocity factor and is now an unknown quantity in your formula. So the TDR is going to ask you as the operator to tell it what the velocity factor is. And it'll be shown right here on the screen. Now, there are a couple of ways you can find the velocity factor. The easiest way is just to know what kind of cable or wire you're testing. Inside the TDR is a predefined list of cables. You go into Setup, select your cable, and you're done. The cable type you've selected will show up at the top of the screen, and the velocity factor is automatically filled in. Keep in mind, the easiest way is not necessarily the best way. Here's why. Velocity factor is determined by the design and the building of the cable. Cable manufacturers are permitted a generous margin between the published and actual velocity factor. Once the cable is built, simply handling the cable can change the velocity factor. So any error shown in the entered velocity factor will directly show up in your distance readings. A more accurate way of finding velocity factor is to run a test on a sample piece of cable. So, take a piece of cable of the same type that you'll be testing and measure its length exactly down to the inch. Hook your TDR up to the sample cable. Then tell the TDR to sample it. The TDR will send a pulse down the cable. It'll log the time it took for that test pulse to return. Then it'll ask the operator how long the cable is. 
So now we can head back to our formula. The TDR has the time information it needs. The operator provided the distance information. Now the TDR has everything it needs to reverse engineer this formula and come up with a velocity factor, which it will display to the operator on the screen. Okay, let's look at a worst case scenario. Let's say you're testing a wire. You have no idea how long it is. You don't know what kind of cable it is, or you don't have a sample of it, which means you don't know the velocity factor. Now this cable has an open right here. Can you still use the TDR to troubleshoot it? Yes, you can. You just have to do a little bit more math. Oh, and be able to gain access to both sides of the cable. Using the method I'm going to show you, it makes no difference what the velocity factor is, so just leave it where it's set. First, measure the distance to the open from one side. Let's say it reads 75 feet. Then measure the distance to the open from the other side. Let's say it reads 25 feet. Now, these distances are not accurate, but the ratio between the two distances is. So, if we throw a little bit of math at this problem, we can come up with a reasonably accurate estimate of exactly where that fault's going to be. We need to compare the length of our first measurement to the total measured length of the cable. And our total length can be found by adding our first and second measurements together. Our first measurement accounted for 75 feet of a total of 100 feet of measurement. Simplified, this is 3 quarters of the total. And in English, what does this tell us? The problem is 3 quarters of the length of the cable away from our first measurement, or a quarter of the length of the cable away from our second measurement. These estimates are close enough that you can probably eyeball it to find the problem. Well, that about exhausts my knowledge base on velocity factor which is used for determining distance. The scale on the left side of a TDR trace indicates impedance. Well, that's nice to know, but what exactly is impedance? To explain that, let's discuss this first. Let's take a simple battery-powered circuit. The voltage in the circuit is what we call DC. When we close the switch, current will flow in one direction. Out of the battery, over to the light, through the light, then back to the battery. While the current is flowing through the light bulb, it starts to produce illumination. This little light from darkness miracle is caused by resistance. To explain resistance, let me throw another analogy at you. Electricity travels through a wire very easily, just like your hand traveling through air does. But if you take that same hand and try to push it through a bucket of water, the water will resist the movement of your hand, making it harder for you to move. The result will be your hand will slow down. You'll actually be moving water, and believe it or not, producing a little bit of heat in that water. What you've done is transfer energy from your arm into the water in the form of movement and heat. The light bulb treats electricity the same way. It slows the electricity down and converts the energy transferred to it into light and heat. Now, if you have an alternating voltage like the electricity in the wall of your house, the current doesn't actually flow in one direction like a DC system does. The current actually wiggles back and forth real fast. But it will respond in the same way to resistance, and the light bulb will light up. Here's the problem. As the AC voltage travels down the wire, causing your current to wiggle back and forth as it goes along, electromagnetic fields of force build up around that wire. Now, let's place another wire parallel to our original wire. This means the wires are running side by side. When it comes time for those electromagnetic forces to break down and turn back into a voltage, they find it's easier to do it on the extra wire instead of their original wire. So what this effectively means is some of your AC voltage has transferred over to the new wire. In layman's terms, the original wire that your voltage was on is acting like a transmit antenna. The second wire is acting like a receive antenna, like the radio in your car. There are several forces at work that try to prevent this transfer of voltage. These forces are called impedance. So this impedance is the same as an electrical resistance, but only AC voltages can see it. Impedance's unit of measurement is exactly the same as resistance. Both are measured in ohms. So for example, a wire this far away could have 75 ohms of impedance. Move the wire closer, and it's easier to transfer the signal, so your impedance has dropped. Vice versa, move the wire further away. It's harder to transfer your signal, so your impedance increases. What the TDR is designed to do is to measure this impedance, or the distance the wires are apart from each other. Let's take a look at a sample. So we know the first thing we need is two wires that run side by side. Disconnect both ends of the wires from whatever they're hooked up to. Hook up your TDR to the two wires, and this is the trace you'll get. The first part of the trace is telling you 75 ohms of impedance exists between the two wires. Then, as the two wires get further apart, impedance increases to 125 ohms. You'll eventually come to the open in the wire located right here. The TDR trace shoots up off the top of the screen. This is because the impedance has reached infinity. The TDR will not be able to see anything beyond the open. Let's take a look when the two wires are shorted together. 
the tray starts out just like before. 75 ohms for the first section of wire, 125 ohms for the second section of wire, but the place where it's shorted, there is no impedance. So the trace on a TDR will go to zero. Finally, let's talk about the impedance scale. You'll see it's labeled Z ohms. The ohms we just talked about, it's resistance. The Z is the symbol they use to indicate impedance resistance. The TDR will have a button that allows the operator to change the range of this scale. In this case, we're looking at from 0 to 200 ohms. Here's the problem. That range is too high for the signal you're looking at. With the scale set this high, a very small event like this bad splice can be easily overlooked. So here we see that we've reduced the scale from 200 ohms to 125. Now the bad splice is clearly visible. Let's talk about reading the TDR trace. As we mentioned earlier in this graphic, in addition to seeing impedance, the TDR sees the resistance in the circuit. This resistance is shown on this line. You'll notice that it's gradually rising above the line that it started out on. The technical term for this trace characteristic is called dribble up. And nope, I have no idea how they came up with that. What this is actually showing you is the resistance in the wire itself. The smaller a wire is, the more resistance it has per foot. The dribble up can actually tell you a lot about the quality of the cable you're checking. You'll notice that this is an unusually large climb in the dribble up. I can think of at least two reasons for this. The first is you're measuring RG174. It's a small diameter coax with a very thin center conductor, so it does have a lot of resistance. That makes this trace normal. However, seeing this trace on another type of cable could mean that the quality of the cable was extremely low when it was manufactured. Technical term is cheap. So if this was the cable for your cable TV going into your house, you're going to have a really bad picture. Now, let's go back and take a look at what your test leads are going to look like on your trace. The most common way a TDR is hooked up is to use alligator clips. This will, however, present a little teeny problem. Notice in this picture how tightly wound your alligator clip wires are. This is the proper hookup method. If your test leads are separated like this, remember the TDR is measuring the distance between the wires. So this hookup connection will show up as a spike on your trace. If you want to test a coax, keep the leads tightly wound. Red lead goes on the center conductor. Black lead goes on the outer shield. The coax shield will act as your second wire. Now, if you don't want to have to deal with this test lead display problem, Go into your TDR menus and look for something that says test lead calibration. What this will do is completely remove the test leads from your display trace. Now that our test leads are taken care of, let's set up our impedance scale. If we take a look at a coax cable, the impedance will be measured between the center conductor and the outer shield. For the vast majority of the coaxes, this will run right around 50 ohms. If you're measuring a twisted pair, the impedance is between the two wires and tends to run about 100 ohms. So, for the average coax, you should set your mid-scale impedance to about 50 ohms. And for a twisted pair, set mid-scale to about 100 ohms. So far, all the traces in this video that I've shown you have been between two wires. This produces a nice, clean, linear trace. I regret to inform you, you very rarely will ever see a trace as nice as you've seen so far. Here's why. The two wires you're measuring have the impedance between them. But if you add another wire close to it, it will also affect the impedance. Add a fourth wire, and your impedance will change again. Heck, let's throw in the airframe of the aircraft. If you're close to the airframe, that will affect the impedance. And finally, let's say your wire is traveling down a big 2-inch wire bundle. The distance from your wire to all the other wires in the bundle will change as it goes along inside the bundle. So what you're more likely to see is a trace that kind of wanders up and down. And in big bundles, this wandering can be quite significant. So let's throw some general rules out for impedance. The more wires in your bundle, the lower your overall impedance will be. And likewise, the fewer wires in the bundle, the higher your impedance will be. Closer wires result in a lower impedance. Wires further apart result in a higher impedance. And finally, these rules apply to any wire or airframe that's next to the wire you're measuring. Heck, let's add one more rule. Here's a trace that was done on a wire that's still on the spool. The rolled up wire is actually interfering with its own test. To properly test this wire, you need to pull it off the spool. The most common use for TDR is to look for opens or shorts in the wire. The displays look different depending on if you're using a pulse or a step TDR. The left graphic shows a pulse TDR. The open is shown by the dotted line, commonly called the cursor. It'll be located at the front of the waveform where it starts to go up. The step TDR shown on the right side is much easier to read. When an open is detected, 
the trace line goes straight up off the top of the screen. Again, the exact position of the open is shown by the dotted line at the beginning of the waveform. Where on an open the trace goes up, on a short the traces go down. This screen shows a coax cable with a connector at about 50 feet. The connector is corroded, so the trace jumps up at the connector, then continues on at a higher level. This is showing the resistance in the corroded connector. This little jump right here shows a coax shield fault. Let's say you're testing your TCAS and the coax cable is hanging out the door. Then someone wanders by and slams the door closed on your cable for some unknown reason. I don't know, maybe they had a bad day at home. Anyway, this will cause a pinch in the cable, damaging it. It will ruin your cable calibration, cause your TCAS test set not to work properly, it can even cause the radio waves in the coax to be reflected back into the test set, damaging it. Want to check the quality of your splices? A very small bump is a good splice. A large bump is a bad splice. Let's say you need to check a single wire, but there's no other wires that run alongside of it. You can cross your fingers and fill your heart with hope, then use the aircraft airframe or your automotive chassis as your return. This may or may not work depending on how close that wire runs to the airframe. But you can be sure of one thing. Every situation will look completely different on the screen. This is what a wet cable looks like. When the outer sleeve of a coax is damaged, the metal shielding of the coax acts like a giant sponge and just absorbs water. Then the water is wicked up the cable. The water reduces the impedance of the cable and makes your distance readings unreliable. What you can try to do is measure from both ends to try to isolate where the water starts and stops. This isn't just for the cable TV guys. Aviation technicians have to know about it as well. Aircraft cables normally run close to the skin of the aircraft. Both the skin and the cables are extremely cold. Put a couple hundred people in that airplane, each one expelling moisture every time they breathe. You can picture the condensation like a glass of ice water sitting on a table. Over time, a damaged coax cable sleeve can collect quite a bit of water. Here we see a technician's worst nightmare, an intermittent fault. What the TDR sees each time it sends out a pulse can be changing, which will result in an erratic trace. To troubleshoot this one, enlist the help of another person to watch a TDR while you travel along the wire moving it. Eventually you'll find the spot that's causing the erratic reading. I've mentioned it before, but here's a workaround. Try not to transmit into an impedance matching device or an LRU. However, if there's no way around it and you have to transmit into an LRU, do some research and find out the length of the cable you're testing. Then set the cursor to the known length of the cable. From this point on, ignore anything on the trace after your cursor. Finally, if you have a trace that looks like this with a lot of spikes, this is caused by electrical noise on the wire you're testing. You have two options to fix this. Hopefully your TDR has a noise filter you can turn on. If not, simply turn power off the aircraft while you're testing the wire. Your trace will be much easier to read without all that electrical noise. Okay, we're just about done here. If you don't happen to own a TDR and looking into buying one, I'd like to say that from several decades of experience in working on aircraft, I've used a lot of different models of TDRs. And by far the simplest and easiest to use TDR was from AEA Technologies. This company really seems to have its act together. They're very simple to use. Their documentation is outstanding. They even post videos on YouTube on how to use their equipment. And no, I'm not getting a kickback from the company. They don't even know I made this video. But I do have one other comment about companies. If you're running a company and you're smart enough to purchase a TDR, please provide your employees with training on how to use it. I've seen tens of thousands of dollars of wasted money and hundreds of hours of aircraft downtime. All wasted because the company wouldn't spend a dime on training, while the technicians fell back to using the multimeter as the TDR collected dust in the tool room. Heck, show them this video. That won't cost you anything. Well, thanks for watching and happy troubleshooting.